When they heard their names, immediately they regained their Iman and they joined forces back with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And when they uh, rejoined with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam led the expedition himself and he picked up a handful of stones and rocks and pebbles and he threw it in the direction of the archers and he said, Shahatil Wujuh. He said that may your faces be blackened and blinded. And SubhanAllah, it is as if every one of those archers, they felt the the, the, the blast, they felt this sand, they felt the pebbles right on them and they became blinded and they stopped sending their volleys of arrows and this was a miracle that clearly uh, Allah Azza wa Jal gifted the Prophet with that simply throwing one handful of sand towards these thousands of archers, it blinded all of them simultaneously and all of a sudden the volleys of arrows stopped. And when the volleys of arrows stopped, what happened? Obviously the Muslims, they all began rushing towards the army of Hunayn and they began battling with the army of Hunayn and the Prophet is invoking uh, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, calling the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and he says, وَرَبَّ مُحَمَّدٍ I swear by the Lord of Muhammad, you are going to be destroyed. And so with this energy, with this enthusiasm, with this zeal, over uh, 12,000 of the Sahaba charging forward, the army of Hunayn, they lost their bearings, they lost their courage and down to the last man, they turned back and they fled. And when they fled, they left thousands of uh, uh, of their possessions, their, their, their animals, their horses. They, they left their entire families because they had come, as we had said, they had come with all of their families. And of course, not only uh, did the Muslims fight, of course, we need to mention here as well that Allah Azza wa sent angels down as well. And Juwayd ibn Mut'im uh, narrated, he was a part of the battle of, of, of Hunayn. He narrated that I saw as if a huge black cloud coming down and then I saw it disperse into the people as if they were small ants going everywhere and these were the angels of Allah coming to help the Muslims against uh, the people of Hunayn, the people of Hawazin. And there are many stories mentioned about riders coming down that could not be recognized about uh, people on horses that were coming from the heavens. These are of course the angels that came down to help the Muslims against the tribe of Hawazin. And with, with, when the battle finished and when uh, this entire encounter finished, the Muslims conquered and acquired more property than they had ever acquired in any battle. It is said that there were over 6,000 captives taken, 6,000 captives taken. And it is said that over 24,000 camels, the entire camels of the tribe of Hawazin, over 40,000 goats. And this is uh, literally in our times, we would calculate this in the hundreds of millions of dollars. Literally in our times, we're talking about hundreds of millions of dollars. This is a, a massive amount of money that was unprecedented that the Muslims have ever, have ever uh, acquired. And the Prophet Sallallahu ordered that all of these prisoners and all of this war booty, it be kept at a valley called the Valley of Ji'irana, the place of Ji'irana. And he said, keep it here under armed guard outside of Mecca. And he commanded that the prisoners be treated justly and equitably and treated fairly. These were all women and children in the end of the day, and they be given food and shelter and that they would be dealt with and the property would be distributed after he returned because the matter was not yet settled. Why was it not settled? Well, because the, the, the army or the, the, the male members of the tribe had all fled. Where had they fled to? The largest group of them, they fled to the city of Ta'if. And the city of Ta'if was a city that was, uh, already we have discussed this in the seerah, that the Prophet had tried to give da'wah to the people of Ta'if and they had rejected him. And the city of Ta'if, as we had said before, was nestled on top of a mountain and it had a large wall or fortress or barrier. And this fortress or barrier prevented any army from ever attacking Ta'if. They were at the top of the mountain. They had plenty of water, plenty of vegetation. So the tribe of Hawazin, many of them, their male members, they fled to Ta'if. Another small group they fled to another area called Atwas and the Prophet sent an army to battle them over there and that was a victory as well. And yet others they fled helter skelter across the, the, the peninsula and they simply ran away uh, wanting to regroup at another time. And so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam had to make his way to Ta'if to deal with the people of Ta'if. One very interesting story before we get to the siege of Ta'if that when the prisoners of war were being rounded up and they were being taken to Ji'irana, 
one of the ladies amongst them began shouting and, and screaming that how can you treat me like this and I am the sister of your prophet. I am the sister of your leader. And they were wondering, what is this? The Prophet does not have any sister. But she insisted and she kept on saying, take me to your leader, I am his sister. And so uh, the news reached the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he came and he, uh, and he uh, talked to this lady. And it turned out that this was Shayma bint al-Hadith. And Shayma bint al-Hadith, she uh, is the foster sister of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. She is the daughter of Halima. And she was the one who took care of the Prophet ﷺ when he was a young lad. And so uh, she is now, of course, an elderly lady. She is now, of course, uh, you know, in her 60s. But she is a, a, a foster sister in that her mother uh, was the foster mother of the Prophet ﷺ. And so the Prophet ﷺ said, how do I know that you are Shayma? How do I know that you are Shayma? Yes, I know Shayma is my sister. How do I know you are Shayma? And so she said, I still have the bite on my back that you bit me with one time when I was carrying you as a baby. And so the process immediately knew that this must be Shema because only Shema would know this incident that, you know, one time maybe as a baby or as a young man, as a young child, excuse me, the Prophet when he was on her back, he might have bit her as a playful bite or whatever. And she still has the mark. So she said, I still have this mark on my back. When you bit me as a baby, I still have it on my back. And so he immediately knew that this was Shema bint al-Hadith and so he ordered her away from the other captives and he laid his uh, his cloak for her, he freed her, he gave her gifts and it is also said in some of the books that Halima as well came and, uh, and uh, Shayma, her husband came uh, and they both embraced Islam and, and uh, 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 Shayma's parents embraced Islam including Shayma and the Prophet gifted them with a lot of gifts. And this is an interesting story that uh, it is mentioned that Halima al Saadiya, the foster mother of the Prophet and her immediate family, they all accepted Islam. Now we have already mentioned that uh, the battle of Hunayn is one of two battles that the Quran mentions by name. The other battle being the battle of Badr. And both of these battles are very significant and in some ways they are really like the first and the last battles ever fought really within the Arabian Peninsula against the Arabs. And so it is as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is finishing and concluding. Now, the battle of Hunayn is not the final battle in that. There is another major battle that is to be fought and that is Tabuk. However, the battle of Tabuk did not have any actual fighting taking place. And so the last battle that was fought with, with swords and with blood was the battle of Hunayn. This was the last major battle. Of course, there were many small skirmishes uh, after this, but the last major battle was the battle of Hunayn. And so it is as if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling them, from Badr to Hunayn, I helped you all out. These are the two names that are mentioned. Also, both Badr and Hunayn were major victories. And it is befitting that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions both of them. Of course, Badr was the type of victory that, that the likes of which the Muslims had never seen. 315 of them conquered over a thousand of the Quraysh and they destroyed every one of the senior leaders of the uh, Quraysh. And this was a big victory and Allah called it a, uh, a great victory for the Muslims. And of course Hunayn was the greatest financial victory that the Muslims have ever been given. And both of these Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions them by name and it is befitting that he mentions them by name. So we had mentioned now therefore that the battle of uh, of Hunayn was a resounding success. And the tribe of Hawazin was routed and many of them fled to Ta'if. So the Prophet realized that he has to now deal with the very city that once expelled him so many years ago. And so he then ordered the, the, the army to go to Ta'if. Now, Ta'if as we said, was a city that was nestled on top of the mountains and it was surrounded by fortresses and walls. And it was a very difficult city to even imagine fighting. And the Prophet ﷺ understood that he would need a new tactic to fight the city of Ta'if. So he sent two of the Sahaba, Urwa ibn Mas'ud and Ghailan ibn Salama, he sent them to learn techniques about how to fight against a walled fortress. And it is perhaps during the Battle of Khaybar that the Muslims realize that they need to do more than just sit outside of the walls. Because the Battle of Khaybar, if you remember, we talked about this a few episodes ago, Khaybar was composed of many small fortresses. And the Muslims realized that 
to battle a fortress, you need a different tactic, a different technique than to battle against a regular uh, army. And so the Prophet ﷺ sent these two to a faraway tribe, the tribe of Juraish, that had experience in warfare against fortresses. And he sent them, perhaps after the conquest of Mecca, we don't know exactly when, but he sent them to learn the techniques. Within two weeks, they learned as much as they could and they came back to the Prophet Sallallahu and they told him about new techniques and they built these techniques and they built these instruments. What are these instruments? Well, this book of Sirah mentioned three things. Number one, catapults. What is a catapult? You must have all seen in the movies or in cartoons. A catapult is uh, a, a large, uh, a, a, a large instrument of war in which uh, there is a an ar there is a spoon-like structure which is put back, and you put a heavy item on it, and you spring it back, and then it springs forward, and uh, a large rock or a large boulder goes into the uh, into the uh, enemy territory. This is called the catapult. There's also they had a type of uh, a tent, but a tent that was made out of uh, not out of uh, not out, not out of leather, but out of wood, and it is a wooden tent in which people would sit under the tent or come under the tent, and they be able to make their way all the way to the walls of the fortress. Because when you're in a fortress, the people on top of the fortress they can shower you with arrows, they can throw things onto you, so you need protection. So they build a tent made out of strong structure, and people are under the tent and they walk all the way to the walls of the, the fortress and then they can be protected when the army uh, throw th throws things from outside of the wall of the fortress. They also built what we would call a hammering rod. And these types of hammering rods are used to try to open up the doors of the fortress. It is amazing therefore that within two weeks, the Muslims learned all of these tactics and they brought them into uh, the, the, the army. And so that the Muslims learned these tactics when they were fighting against the people of uh, Ta'if. And the Muslims, when they got to the walls of Ta'if, they immediately began trying to shower the people with, uh, with arrows, with volleys. Unfortunately, the people of Ta'if were already prepared because the tribe of Hawazin had come to them, told them the Muslims were coming, and so Ta'if was well prepared for a long drawn out siege. And there was a partial attack that began, but there was never actually a conflict. There was never actually a military conflict between two armies. Why? Because the people of Ta'if never left the city and they remain within the city. And everything that happened, happened through archers and through people from the top of the, uh, of the pulpits, uh, throwing stuff onto the Muslims. The Muslims suffered some heavy casualties. In fact, so much so that after the first day, the Muslims had to withdraw back because they were too close to the walls of the city. And they set up their tent and their main camp at a place that is now the place of the main masjid of Ta'if. And it is called the Masjid of Ibn Abbas. If you ever go to Ta'if, and you will go to the largest masjid of the city, and it is called the Masjid of Ibn Abbas. And at that masjid, that is where the Prophet ﷺ set up his tent and his headquarters. Uh, of course, back then this was outside the city. Now this is inside the, uh, the city. And uh, when the Prophet ﷺ saw the situation, he immediately suggested that now is not the time to now is not the time to fight against these people. Let us leave them and go back to Medina, and we will deal with them later. Because he figured out and he saw that it seemed like a hopeless situation. The Sahaba, however, were eager and they wanted to fight, and so they insisted, and therefore the Prophet ﷺ agreed to their insistence. And uh, the the Muslims began a siege of the city. However, do realize that the city of Ta'if, it has plenty of water from the rain because it's in the top of the mountains. And so the rainwater is very, uh, is very frequent over there. And also the city of Ta'if has vegetation and it has fruits growing there. And so the fact of the matter is that no matter how long you remain outside, they have their water supply and they have their fruits and they have their food. It is very difficult to do a long uh, siege. And slowly but surely, the Muslims kept on uh, dying by the dozens through the arrows. In fact, in one time, they actually uh, took this, this uh, tent, if you like, close to the, the walls and the tribe of Ta'if was prepared. Instead of throwing them with, uh, with arrows, they threw molten lead or molten copper and this burnt through the entire wood and it also killed some of the Muslims under this tent. And so this was really a very uh, a difficult time. Uh, the Prophet ﷺ camped outside of the city probably for more than 20 days. 
The reports differ, some say 15, others say more than a month. However, it appears around 15 to 20 days, the Prophet ﷺ camped outside the city and uh, he made a general announcement and he said, and he announced uh, through, through the messengers and emissaries that anyone who converts from the city of Ta'if and joins us, he and his family shall be safe. Uh, because again, the goal is that the people convert to Islam. The goal is not to kill or to acquire property. The goal is to convert the people to Islam. And so he made this announcement. And because of this, uh, more than two dozen people, one by one, they left the city of Ta'if. Some of their senior leaders, some of their most respected members, they converted to Islam and they joined the army of the Muslims. However, after 20 or, or we said some reports say 30 or 40 days, after all of this long time, the Muslims realized that there really was no point in remaining around because there is no battle taking place, there is no actual encounter. So what is the point of remaining? And therefore, uh, when the Prophet ﷺ suggested for the second time, let us go back to Medina, what do you think? Immediately they agreed and they said, yes, Ya Rasulullah, uh, let us go back to Medina. So the siege of Ta'if did not result in a victory. It wasn't a loss, but it wasn't a victory either. The siege of Ta'if seemed to be a stalemate in that the tribe of Ta'if, the tribe of Thaqif was still upon its shirk and upon its opposition to the Prophet Sallallahu And in fact, when they left, uh, some of the Muslims became irritated and they said, O Messenger of Allah, why don't you curse the people of Ta'if? Curse them. And the Prophet ﷺ raised his hands up and they all thought that he would curse the people of Ta'if and he said, O oh Allah, guide the people of Thaqif to Islam. O oh Allah, guide the people of Thaqif to Islam. And SubhanAllah, the Prophet ﷺ had saved the people of Ta'if once before because the angel had come to him and the angel had said to him, if you want, I can destroy these people for what they have done to you. He saved them then. Why should he not save them one more time? SubhanAllah, it doesn't make sense that he would ask for their destruction once he has saved them. And of course, Allah responded to his dua less than one year later. In fact, 11 months after this dua, the people of Ta'if themselves came to Medina embracing Islam and begging the Prophet for forgiveness. And we'll talk about that inshallah in our future uh, episodes. Uh, so the Prophet made dua for the people of Ta'if. Also, uh, the, the, the back and forth of the Prophet shows the importance of shura. It shows the importance of asking other people for advice. And subhanAllah, the Prophet he asked them once, what do you think? Let's go back to Medina. And they said, no, we want to fight. And then he asked them again and they said, yes, let us go back to Medina. And he is the Prophet of Allah. He doesn't need to take their advice, but this shows us that the leader is never a unilateral leader. The leader listens to the people underneath him. And so when the people underneath him wanted the Prophet Sallallahu to stay, he stayed. And when they agreed to leave, he leave. And this shows us that the Prophet Sallallahu was a true leader in that he took the advice of the people as long as it was permissible to take advice. And then he went on as the people saw fit. It also shows us, brothers and sisters, that the advice of the Prophet is always the best advice. He wanted to leave. They should have listened to him from the beginning, but they didn't uh, do so. And when they didn't do so, they kept on being protracted and delayed. And more and more lives were lost. At least two dozen Muslims lost their lives in the siege of Ta'if. And by the way, some people call it the battle of Ta'if. And there's nothing wrong with that, but it is more appropriate to call it the siege of Ta'if because there was no actual battle. And so we can say the battle of Hunayn and the siege of Ta'if, right? And these two things occurred within two weeks of one another. Hunayn and Ta'if, they occurred within two weeks of one another. So they are very, very close uh, to each other. Uh, and so the siege of Ta'if, it is a, a, a very big uh, lesson for all of us. What is the one of the most important lessons we learn from this uh, siege? One of the most important lessons we learn, brothers and sisters, is that even the Prophet wasallam, even after the conquest of Mecca, did not just gain victory after victory after victory. That the Prophet wasallam, was tested with some victories and some, and some setbacks. And Allah Azza wa Jal didn't just open up everything for him simultaneously. That after this major victory of uh, the conquest of Mecca, even then Allah Azza wa didn't just open up the doors of Ta'if for the Muslims, they had to, uh, it wasn't just handed to them on a silver platter, they had to try and they struggled and they did not succeed at this time. And this is to prove to us that this life is a life of test, that this life is not a life of ease, that even after the conquest of Mecca, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam 
had to uh, still uh, go to the city of Ta'if and still uh, be set back in this, in, this, in this incident and the people of Ta'if did not accept Islam, he still forgave them. And of course we learn the gentle nature of the Prophet Wasallam and his generosity. He has forgiven them once, he will forgive them again. And we learn as well that patience will always bring about sweet fruits. That the Prophet forgave them once, forgave them again, then what happened? The people of Ta'if themselves came all the way to Medina. A year later, 11 months later, begging for forgiveness and asking to enter Islam. And that is, of course, uh, what the goal of the Prophet was. So, my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, these are the two incidents, the Battle of Hunayn and the Siege of Ta'if. And uh, in our next episode, we'll continue talking about one final incident that is related to this, and that is what happened to the spoils of war, what happened to all of these thousands of prisoners of war, and the money, and the animals, and all of this uh, that, that the Prophet ﷺ kept at Ji'irana. And then we will move on to the next episode in the seerah of the Prophet ﷺ, and the final year and a half of the Prophet ﷺ's life. Until next episode, I hope to see you then. والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته جمال الوجود بذكر الإله وتصف الحياة